Hello, this is Jesus Fernandez, and this is the first of a series of tutorials introducing you to the basic lighting on Redshift and Maya. On this tutorial, we're going to talk about the Redshift physical light. First, we're going to start with the creation of a physical light. For that, go to Redshift Lights and click on Redshift physical light. This is going to create a default light on the center of your scene. If you are used to auto render engines, you have to take into account that with Redshift you can actually change the size of the light with the scale tool, and this is not going to affect incorrectly the behavior of your lights. I already have the basic setup for my scene. Let's make a quick render for you to see the results. We are going to start with the settings for the Redshift physical light. You can see on the attribute editor that the first setting to pop is the on-off switch. After that, we have the light type. Redshift has four main types of light. The aerial light, it's a light that has a real physical size and shape. The point light, which simulates a light bulb, which emits lights in all directions from an infinitesimally small spot in space. We have also the spotlight that emit light on a cone shape and finally, we have the directional light, that is an infinite light that simulates a faraway light from the scene. This one has no position, only direction, and all the rays are parallel and has no decay. The default and most used light is going to be the area light. Here on the attribute editor, we can find the specific settings for the area light. With this type of light, you can choose between five types of shapes. The default is going to be the rectangle, as you guys saw in the video. This shape can be described as a basic plane that emits light from a single phase. After that, we can find the disk. Again, it's pretty basic and emits light from a single phase. The sphere is a more complex type of light, because this one is a 3D sphere, which emits light in all directions. The cylinder is similar to the sphere. The only difference is that this one is not a closed mesh and has a hole on the center. And the last one is the mesh. This one takes a mesh on the scene as the shape for the light to be emitted. We are going to review the mesh shape on a later tutorial. The visibility defines if the shape of the area light is going to be visible on the render or not. The bidirectional option only works with the rectangle and disk shapes. Let's move a little bit the light for you to see the results. When you activate this option, both of the faces of the rectangle or disk are going to emit light. Normalize intensity. This one is a tricky one. It removes the area of the light from the lighting calculation. Enabling this option prevents the light intensity from changing when the size of the light change. And the samples defines the number of ray samples to use for the area light. Samples only works with bucket render, not with IPR render. Let's change to bucket render for you to see how the samples works. More samples will produce smoother results. Also, the larger and more intense an area light is, the more samples it needs to produce noise-free results. So, as a tip, try to stay away from the big bright lights as much as possible. Now, on bucket render, we can see that there are some parts of the render that have a lot of noise. So, let's try again with a bigger value for samples. As you can see, we have a noise-free result on the render. With just the adjustment of the sample values, we can clear out most of the noise that we had before. With that, we check all the specific settings for the area light. So let's move to the next type of light. The point light behaves as a light bulb. This light is not size dependent, so you can change the size and it's not going to affect its behavior nor the intensity. There are no specific settings for this type of light. After that, we have the spotlight. This one is an easy one to describe, as it is a cone shape that emits light. For this type of light, we have the cone angle and the falloff angle. The cone angle specifies the angle of the spotlight cone. 
This is going to change the aperture of the cone. And the fall off angle specifies the angle over which light falls off at the edge of the spotlight cone. The higher the value, the softer the edge, and the lower the value, the sharper the edge. And finally, we have the directional light, which is an infinite light that simulates a faraway light from the scene. This type of light is perfect to simulate a distant light like the sun. Now that we have already saw the behavior of the four types of red to physical light, we're going to start with the general settings. First, on the intensity tab, we have the color mode. Here you can choose between two different settings, color and temperature. Color defines the light color as RGB values and temperature as Kelvin degrees. After that, we have the unit type. It specifies the physical units to use for the light intensity and we have phi types. First, the image or default type is a non-physical unit. Here, the color and intensity multiplier defines the final color of the light. Also, it's size dependent, meaning that the size of your light is going to affect the amount of visible light emitted by the aerial light. If you make your light bigger, the amount of visible light is going to raise, and if you make your light smaller, the amount of visible light is going to be less. We also have luminous power. It uses lumens as the basic unit. The lumens measure the visible light emitted by the source, in this case, the area light. As this unit measures the visible light and not the area of the source, it's not size dependent. So you can actually change the scale of the light and the visible light is going to remain the same. An example for luminous power, it's the visible light emitted by the sun or sunlight. As you can see, we will have to make the intensity multiplier value bigger than the image value to have a similar amount of visible light on the scene. On luminance, the units are a candle per square meter, and it refers to the luminous intensity per unit area. This type of unit takes the area of the light into account, not just the visible light emitted, meaning that this unit is size dependent. After that, we have radiant power. The units for radiant power are watts. It measures the amount of radiant energy emitted by the source of light. Taking the sun example, the radiant power will not be the sunlight itself as the luminous power but the radiant energy used on solar power generation. This type of light, it's not size dependent. And finally, we have radiance. The unit for this type, it's the watts per steridian per square meter. It defines how much of the power emitted, reflected, transmitted, or received by a surface will be received by the camera from a specific angle of view. As this unit takes the area into account, it's size dependent. We recommend the use of image as the default unit to measure the light. Now we have ray contribution. You can define the light's contribution to either the diffuse values or the specular values. For this part, we are going to turn off the secondary lights on our scene, so you can see clearly the results of these options. When I turn the effect diffuse option off, the amount of ray contribution for the diffuse values is going to disappear and the light it's going to affect the specular values only. Likewise, it's going to happen if I turn off the effect specular option. You can see that we have the contribution to the diffuse values and its reflections and refractions, but all the specular highlights are missing on the scene. If I turn off both options, it will leave only visible the source of the light and the refractions on our scene. The matte shadow illuminator options defines if the light can illuminate shadow capture surfaces, like the shadow cut shader. This is going to be explained further on a later tutorial. The scales refers to the specific control of the ray contributions. Here you can change the amount of contribution for the diffuse and glossy values, being zero, no contribution, and one, a full value contribution. Also, we have decay. On decay, we have three main types. Inverse square, that is the default type and the physical type of decay that the light has on the real world. This decay can be explained as that the energy twice as far from the source spreads over four times the area, hence one-fourth of the intensity. We also have non-decay, that it's going to create an infinite type of light, and it behaves similar to the directional light. Here, the amount of light emitted over the distance is going to be the same that on the source. As you can see, as the light does not decay, the amount of visible light is a lot more than the inverse square type of decay. 
so you have to take that into account. And finally, we have linear decay. The light intensity decreases directly with distance. Here, we have two options to tweak. First, the falloff start that specifies the distance from the light at which linear falloff occurs. And falloff stop defines when the linear falloff ends. This type of decay is physically incorrect, but you can achieve great results anyway. Now, let's go back to the inverse squared type of decay to keep going with the tutorial. For the shadows, we have five options. First, we have the enable options, which enables shadow casting for the light. When off, the light does not cast shadows. Transparency specifies the opacity of the shadows cast by the light. Lower values cast darker shadows. A value of zero, it's going to cast a black shadow. And a value of one, it's not going to cast shadow at all. The area light does not have the option to change the softness nor the samples for shadows. Being a physical light on size and shape, the bigger the light, the softer the shadows, and the smaller the light, the sharper the shadows cast by the light, and the samples are being defined by the samples values that we saw before. These two options work with a non-area type of light, so we are going to change to a point light. The softness value specifies edge softness for light shadows. A value of zero means no softness and sharp shadows values above zero will produce softer shadow edges and the samples value is defined by the softness value the higher the value of the softness the more samples will be necessary to achieve noise free results and last for the volume contribution first we need to add an atmosphere to yield results so we are going to the output menu on the render settings and we are going to create a volume scatter node on the atmosphere slot now, with our light selected, we are going to look for the Volume tab. The Contribution Scale defines the intensity of the light's global volume scatter contribution. A value of zero disables volume scattering for the light. And as you can see, now, with a quite easy setup, we have a great looking environmental fog applied to our scene. And the samples specifies the number of samples to use for the volume scattering effect. Increasing the number of samples will reduce noise, but at the cost of performance. This is a strong effect, but you have to use it carefully because of its performance cost. With this, we came to the end of the first on the series of tutorials for the introduction to lighting with Redshift. I hope you enjoy it as I did. See you next time and happy rendering.